Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. They're over 300 million years old. They can date these guys back to the time of the dinosaurs. The damage on a river is cumulative. Every single action counts. So this is the first time since the battle that they've ever come out and actually tried to do a scientific archaeological study here. And it's going to be a one-time thing. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. On a cold morning in northeast Texas, these biologists are assembling a radio tower on land go down, right? to help restore a rare fish to the water. Today we're putting up a radio telemetry tower at one of our cooperating landowners' ranch. Helping the fish has required no small amount of effort from a number of players. We have 2.6 miles of river front. We are in the cattle business and we're changing our management scheme to help the, the fish here in the bayou. Lift it up. This is one of the three towers that we're putting up. Each tower has antennas pointed both upstream and downstream, so we're able to tell which direction the fish are coming from. Black kitty. that way right. high enough or you can roll it so why would ranchers nonprofits and government agencies go to all this trouble for a fish I've never seen a paddlefish especially a fish most folks have never seen well the paddlefish is one of a kind paddlefish are very unique they're kind of the hodgepodge of the fish world they have no scales like a catfish they have a skeleton made completely out of cartilage like a shark but yet they're a filter feeder like a whale. They may look like mythical creatures, but Wayne Heaton sees paddlefish every day at the Texas Freshwater Fishery Center, just down the road in Athens. I love these fish, they're my favorite fish here, and most people when they walk up to this exhibit have no idea what these fish are. When they open their mouth and it looks like a giant net, that's exactly really what it is, is those gill rakers form a net to catch all the plankton, which are basically small bugs in the water. Now, they're still on the threatened species list here in Texas, but in rivers, say like the Mississippi River, they actually still have seasons for them, and they actually still fish for them. They can actually get over seven feet long and 200 pounds. Paddlefish are the oldest living species of fish that we have in North America. They're over 300 million years old. They can date these guys back to the time of the dinosaurs. And when we dammed up all of our rivers, unfortunately, these guys lost a lot of their spawning habitat. So in part to keep paddlefish from going the way of the dinosaur, Good. groups are working together to restore the fish to Cattle Lake and Big Cypress Bayou. Paddlefish were in this system at one time and they're not here anymore because of the river fragmentation. Paddlefish evolved with seasonal flooding, so restoring more natural flows to the bayou was a first step. In the springtime, during their spawning season, they need a high flow pulse to find their spawning grounds and to lay eggs in the fast current in the river. The average Corps of Engineer dam is more than a half century old, and the guiding plans for operating those dams have not been updated since they were originally built. Really for about 10 years, uh, many groups have been working on mimicking 
these natural flows. Lake of the Pines has done great as a flood control structure, kept Jefferson from flooding, provided lots of water supply for many of the cities. So now we're just asking to add a third feature, which is releases for fish and wildlife. To gauge how the fish respond to these releases, a transmitter is implanted in each fish at the hatchery. Tag is in, and we will sew up the fish. Fish and Wildlife Service, working with other groups like Cattle Lake Institute, the Nature Conservancy, the Corps of Engineers, USGS, Parks and Wildlife, uh, they've actually implanted radio transmitters in 47 paddlefish, and they're going to release them and track them for about six months. In the channel, right in the middle of the river. So, the flow restoration, tower installation, and surgical procedures have all been leading up to this particular moment as the transmitter implanted paddlefish arrive at Cattle Lake State Park. Go a little more. I think if we just put paddlefish back in the river with nothing else happening, uh, chances of their success would be low. There are a lot of pieces to this project and a lot of different groups working on it. Today, we're gonna release about 50 of them. You do not forget them when you see one. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, all the uh, incisions look good. Everything's going great. The fish look really good. They're going to find things to eat, and they're going to grow yeah, and hopefully thrive. One by one, paddlefish are reintroduced to the bayou at the state park and several miles upstream in Jefferson. No one can know if the fish will be lost downstream, if they will thrive or even survive. But hopes are high. Oh, that's so exciting. It's really gratifying to, to, to see this day come. We, we've all been working at it for, for many years, and, and to see this release happen today, and it's just a good day for the fish and a good day for East Texas and Caddo. <laughs> It's been about four months now. Since the release, we've contacted 46 of the 47 fish. The uh, towers that we put up, they've been doing the majority of the work for us. The idea of when we go out in the boats is we're trying to find where those fish are between towers. This is where we've seen fish before. You never know. With months to spread out over 60 miles of waterway, the fish can be tough to locate. Yeah, we've gone several miles. We haven't heard anything yet. That's kind of how tracking goes. Hours of searching may not yield a single signal. But you know, not finding fish there is actually data also. For whatever reason that is, none of the fish are choosing that habitat at the moment. Where paddlefish are being found is a bit of a surprise. Many have traveled as far as possible in the opposite direction. The one interesting thing that we've seen is a lot of fish attracted by the flow coming out of Lake of the Pines which have been identified as being present there at the spillway. The unanticipated result was that half the fish went up to Lake of the Pines. We see little glimpses of things we think might be important, but in another two months we might go, well, this is why that happened, but now they're doing something else. So we've got a little snapshot of what the paddlefish needs, and we really need the bigger picture of what the paddlefish needs. We're about halfway done. But as the tracking and data collection continue, it is already clear this cooperative effort will benefit more than just one fish. I think the paddlefish is a means to an end. I mean, we like to see the paddlefish in here, obviously, but that in turn helps a lot of other species, a lot of other things in the environment. So it's a win-win. It is also a win-win if one threatened fish can teach us how to better manage such a complex and beautiful ecosystem. Cattle Lake has the most diverse freshwater fish species in any system in the state of Texas. All the other species that rely on natural river flows and good river habitat are going to benefit from this project. It's just one part of the much, much bigger picture. To learn more about paddlefish research or to track them online, visit cattlelakeinstitute.us.
family ranch here has been in our family since 1968. We've been on this river different places uh, for five generations. For Sky Louie, the Nueces River is home. There's so much you can learn from a river. And for the river, Sky is a devoted guardian. You know, it's more of a mission than just a job, but uh, work for the Nueces River Authority. My job is resource protection. The first big management problem that we became aware of was the off-road vehicles and stream beds. Harm being done by uh, vehicular traffic in the river, uh, massive amounts at times. Vehicles were using the stream beds like off-road park. They were keeping the vegetation absent. When studies revealed the damage to aquatic life, Sky rallied support for legal protection. Once the activity was prohibited, uh, this thing started recovering. I think this is pretty dramatic. Well, we're see Photos on her ranch show how life has returned to the river, making it more resilient in times of flood and drought, all by removing vehicles and changing grazing practices. We used to graze to the water. Now the riparian area is a special area. We have it fenced out. Sky is not one to just go out and talk about what other people should do. She does it herself. When you see a problem, you can't ignore it. It's very natural to me to solve problems on the land because I'm a part of it. I'm a cowgirl. That's what they do. They solve problems. When an invasive plant posed new threats, Sky was back in the saddle. We began to have an explosion of Arundo Donax. In other watersheds where this river cane has taken hold, the effects have been dramatic. The Arundo doesn't allow wildlife to get down to the river. When we do have flooding events, it channels it, which scours out the river. So it changes the whole ecology. It looks pretty dead. That's a good thing. But on the Nueces, Sky caught the problem early and coordinated a response. So aerial application, and then with the aerial. a lot of follow up on the ground. Mm -hmm. The invasion was halted by hand pulling, applying herbicide and informing lots of landowners. We got every single person. Yeah. With so many landowners being involved, it takes a very special person to pull all that together. She's done great work on her own property right here at the Open V Ranch. And then she's also invited over 200 landowners in the area to sign on right now, and participate. The same information at the same time. It's a major event to try to get everyone together. She's definitely yeah, more than just agree. one person in her effectiveness, but it does start with her shaking a hand or making a, a landowner contact. She has a personal interest in not just the conservation and the ecosystem, but the individual landowners and their histories. I think that's what makes Sky most successful. That's 2.919 million and one. <laughs> and Sky's successes go beyond the millions of undone Arundo plants. For there not to be a continuous problem, it takes people being aware. Her watershed workshops reach landowners statewide, while the River Authority school programs and education campaigns reach other audiences. Damage on a river is cumulative. Every single action counts. And for Sky's own children, who are taking over the hard work of running a ranch, she appears to have been a small influence as well. Just, just a little bit. <laughs> that pea vine. She's definitely rallied yeah. us around the cause. <laughs> to get wildlife food. Ultimately, the whole food. idea of conserving is so that you have something at the end of the equation. It's all about the future generation. I think the future of the Nueces River is forever improved because of Sky Louie's work. It's definitely inspiring. When you love something. I love you guys. Love you too, Mom. Get it in your blood. I appreciate what y'all have invested here because this is pretty rewarding, isn't it? To see this, I mean, ah, oh, that looks good. You know, if we want to leave a proper legacy for future Texas, it's going to take people like Sky. Let's go to the next one. That huh? understand the issues, are committed to finding solutions to those issues, and draw other people in, get them excited, and spread that word.
the beeps of a metal detector, and the push of a shovel. It's an unusual treasure hunt, all in the name of history. While the general facts about the Battle of San Jacinto are clear, the specific details are not. What will they find down below the dirt? Now that's a good signal there. And what will it mean? The answers could transform this landscape into a truer depiction of the 1836 Battle of San Jacinto and the ensuing birth of a free Texas. Its shift change at the refineries surrounding the San Jacinto Battleground State Historic Site. Texas Highway 134 happens to cut right through the site. Sections of the battlefield have freshly cut grass. An aging and deteriorating reflection pool lies where soldiers fought for freedom. Who in 1836 would have known the battleground would look like this? What our goal is to do, obviously, is to interpret the Battle of 1836 as accurately as possible and to preserve the integrity of the battleground itself. And to do that, reflection pool needs to be removed. The uh, contours of the landscape need to be changed such that they look like in 1836. And the prairie grass is restored to their full vigor. 10 years ago, this entire park was mowed five or six times a year, and it was beautiful. It looked like a traditional park, looked a lot like a golf course, but it did not look like it did at the time of the battle. And those native grasses will come right up to the curb. Oh, right up to the right curb. Right up to the curb, yeah. So we would talk to our visitors, and we would realize that they were not able to visualize the descriptions of grass that was uh, belly high on a horse. Sometimes it's described as being waist deep on a man, and they just simply couldn't visualize that and couldn't see the role that the vegetation played in the Battle of San Jacinto. Hundreds of school groups make the trip to San Jacinto every year. And then they're like, well, we're kind of standing where the Mexican camp would have been. Because they're fucking cool. cool. But you have to be looking the other way. Like, if you were looking this way, then the Mexican camp would be like, burn over here. So, wait, no, I think we got it wrong. I think this is where the Mexicans were. It seems interpreting the battle would be a bit easier if sections of the park looked more like an 1836 battlefield. Seeing actually what it was like then might help them understand the, the difficulties of the battles and what the elements that the people that were living and fighting at that time really were up against. So it would help, you know, bring history to life. Right here. History is coming to life, one pile of dirt at a time. Texas Parks and Wildlife archaeologists it's definitely a vertical piece of wood. It might be a fence post. History buffs armed with metal detectors. Something in there, I think. And volunteers. There it is right on the bottom. Right there. Square nail. Are all working to find out exactly what happened and where. Come on, they fired. During the furious 18-minute clash on April 21st, 1836. There are markers placed all over the battleground that interpret various parts of the battle, but they were put there in the late 1880s or early 1890s, about 50 years after the battle occurred. The guys' memories who helped place them there, battle veterans, their memories were fading, uh, the landscape looked different. So we're doing archaeology to help find the exact location of where events occurred during the battle. OK, right about there. Got a three. Sounds pretty good. They've never gone out specifically looking for the battle site there. and looking for battle-related artifacts. So this is the first time since the battle that they've ever come out and actually yep. tried to yep. do a scientific archaeological study here. And it's going to be a one-time thing. When you do it, it's done. You can go back and redo it, but it'll never be the first one. So this is going to be the classic study of the Battle of San Jacinto, and to be a part of it is pretty thrilling. What you got? Musket ball. All right. Battle related. It's heavy, it's a big one. Probably 68, 70 caliber. It's just the luck of the swing of the coil on what it goes over and you get the beep, you could be the one that 
digs up the, the, the greatest relic in the world. You just never know. It's right in here, Joe. The history is a just comes natural with me. So coming out here and digging on this battlefield is kind of like a dream for guys like us that are historians and want to be historians. So uh, this is labor of love. This is the opportunity of a lifetime as far as we're concerned. Oh, what are we right here, Joe? Oh, we've got a brass belt adjuster. This 170-year-old rare piece of history is just one of the hundreds of items the archaeologists have cataloged. It's great, of course, that we found artifacts from the battle, but that's only part of the story. More important is the fact that we have locations of all these different kinds of artifacts, and we can look at their distribution and find out new things about the battle. For example, identification of the musket balls that have been fired helped to tell us how far the battle spread across the landscape of the park. The research may take some time, but the park is already evolving. So let's leave it here. <laughs> I think we should leave it here and back in the middle. And there's a plant ready to plant. Cool. Yeah, make sure you get a nice, good, deep divot there. Back in the 90s, the park restored this coastal marsh. It's now one of the last of these marshes left on the Houston Ship Channel. All of this grass provides places for these young fish and, and young animals to hide from predators and to reach a size where then they can then swim out into the rivers, out into the bays in the Gulf of Mexico. That marble oh, is good. An area that blocked the escape of Mexican soldiers is now the ultimate outdoor classroom. And look at the little squares on the bottom, and you can count how many squares they are. Here's a little leech. They go, oh my gosh, ew, you know, and then all of a sudden they realize, oh, there's critters in this and there's creatures in this and they get really excited and it doesn't bother them one bit. Here's a minnow. Oh, cool. The gooier, the messier, the better they like it. Okay, so if you look in the moss and you look through there, are you going to find other things inside there? I think it's going to really make it a lot more real to them. You know, they see it, they hear it, they smell it, they experience it. And the more senses that a child uses when they're learning, the better they're going to retain it. We were messing with some blue crabs. We saw some shrimp. We saw some water bugs. That was all cool. The success of the coastal marsh and the efforts of the archaeology work have the San Jacinto Battleground State Historic Site on its way back. back in time so the battlefield can tell its own story. The birth of a free Texas deserves nothing less. One of the things we hope to do is restore that sense of sacredness, hallowed ground, as they did at Gettysburg. The battlefield will be just that, a battlefield where you could go out and immerse yourself in the period of 1836 and what happened here. San Jacinto is probably the most important site in the Texas Revolution and future generations of Texans will be able to come here and understand how their state won its independence. And it's all happening because of the archeology span that we're doing here.
At least you didn't fall like two oh, feet. Oh, looking at that more. <laughs> This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.